Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we just wanted to give some space while people are logging in here. So forgive the banter. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off since we're a couple of minutes past, but um, welcome to our, oh gosh, fifth fireside chat. <laughs> uh, fifth, fifth feels right. Um, we're uh, hosted by Climate First Bank. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing our uh, founder, CEO, and chairman of Climate First Bank, Ken LaRoe. Uh, before he uh, started Climate First Bank, Ken had a successful track record of founding and managing two other community banks, uh, Florida Choice Bank and First Green Bank. But the decision to start Climate First Bank stemmed from his uh, profound sense of disappointment after the sale of First Green Bank, coupled with his uh, deep-seated desire to create a better word for his world for his grandchildren. And inspired by the book Project Drawdown, Ken envisioned a bank with a central mission of reducing atmospheric CO2 levels, and that's where Climate First Bank was born. Uh, we started in June of 2021 and inaugurated as the sole benefit corporation bank in the state of Florida. And since its inception, we have operated with a net zero carbon footprint, have earned our certified B Corporation status in July of last year, our 1% for the planet members, um, and are on our race to zero with our loan portfolio. So thank you so much, Ken, for being with us today. Could you please introduce John? Thank you, Lauren. And I got to put a plug in for Lauren. She um, started with us right out of college at First Green and then moved to California. And um, we were able to hook her up with Beneficial State Bank. And she went out there and continued her career for a while and then decided to move back to Florida to be close to family. And we were incredibly fortuitous that she rejoined us. Um, but John, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, I'd like to introduce everybody to John, uh, um, who has become a, a, a good friend over the years. And that was going to be my first question. John was, I can't remember where we met, but we'll get to that. Um, <laughs> and uh, John was kind of the architect or the inventor of uh, regenerative e economics. Um, which I found, find fascinating, especially in, in the uh, study of regenerative buildings and everything regenerative. And after a successful 20-year career on Wall Street with what John calls the old J.P. Morgan, which there's a story there, um, I'm quite sure, John decided he, he had to, to do something to, to make a difference and, and left there and formed the Capital Institute in 2010. And the purpose of the Capital Institute was many fold, but it's, it's evolved a whole lot into uh, education and, and influence in regenerative economics and regenerative finance. And John was featured in the 2021 documentary Going Circular and the new documentary Man on the Run. Uh, which revealed the Malaysian scandal. Uh, he's a co-founder of Grasslands, board member of the Savory Institute, and a full member of the Club of Rome. Uh, John speaks internationally, and I've I've been honored to be in some of the audiences where he spoke, and it is um, a truly a transformational experience. So, uh, John, with that, I, I really, really, again, appreciate you joining us. Oh, and John's got a book that you're, it's coming out this year, right? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Spoken like a true author. <laughs> yeah. uh, Good um, to be with you, Ken. Yeah, thank you again. Um, so Lauren was asking just before we, we started, what's the uh, statue behind you? Well, so that's, uh, there's a, there is a story behind that. I, I, um, so I, I left, my job on Wall Street in actually in 2001. Um, and I just had sort of a, it, there was no like crisis. Uh, the, the, the excuse was that Chase bought Morgan so I could easily walk away and, and uh, the culture was radically different. So I chose to walk away. And, um, uh, but I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, with my life. It was just, I didn't want to keep doing what I was doing. And um, to make a long story short, I first I experienced 9-11 up close and personal. Mm -hmm. And then I got very serious about trying to figure out what the hell is going on in the world. And in that, 
uh, discovered the environmental crisis and and read what was then a not very well known book among bankers called Limits to Growth, and it essentially was the uh, MIT Systems Science Study uh, lead author Dana Meadows, um, which essentially projected out into the future and and showed that we couldn't keep doing what we were doing or we would collapse the system. And I had this sort of overwhelming, I guess I'd call it an epiphany, like this was just, this was truth. Like there was no, there was no way around this being real. And of course the book was being, had been um, chastised around the world. It was written in the 1970s and no one took it seriously. Um, and of course the thesis of the book turned out to be pretty much right on target. And we happen to live at the moment when all the chickens have come home to roost. So the story behind the statue is I, I went into, I'm sure, a clinical depression thinking that, you know, my job was to communicate this to all the powerful people in the world because we had to shift course. And I was incapable of doing that. I didn't know even how to begin it and people weren't listening. And I got pretty overwhelmed with the the burden I put on myself as if I was the one who was going to come to the rescue that I had to play Paul Revere and my wife found this statue in a junk shop and it was meant to remind me that uh, I'm not Atlas and I don't have the weight of the world on my shoulders so that's the story that's a that's a great story and that kind of was it allows me to segue perfectly into a question that journey from managing director at JP Morgan which is a really big deal. I mean, I, I don't remember what you majored in, in in college, but I majored in business and going to work for one of the big investment banking firms was like a dream job, you know. Um, and then to leave there and that journey into regenerative economics kind of feels like a, a journey from the investment world into enlightenment or from <laughs> darkness into enlightenment or something like that. And um, you said that it really wasn't so necessarily an epiphanous moment, but it's kind of, it's a question I often wrestle with, you know, is that whole journey to enlightenment or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with all this, but um, it just, it, it's, it's fascinating. And, and my journey was after I sold my first bank, which was just a standard Florida started up, build it, sell it try to make a bunch of people a bunch of money to first green the the, the classic playbook yes <laughs> the absolute classic playbook and then yeah. um, cindy and i had gotten a mini motorhome and we circumnavigated the country and my brother gave me the book let my people go surfing by yvonne chenard and that was my mm. epiphanal moment yeah. um and i i really attribute it to yvonne i don't uh, i've told him that a couple of times i don't know if he remembers it or not but it at least it it made a big impact on me. Um, so, John, a question I, I have, uh, are, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, yeah. are, are we doomed? No, I don't. I, I certainly don't think we're we're doomed, but I, I do think we've. Um, and by the way, just a, a comment on enlightenment. I, I uh, there was a 10 year period between leaving Wall Street and starting Capital Institute and um, and 10 years is, looking back at it, seemed like it went by in a flash, but 10 years when you're living through it is a, is a long, is a long search. And, um, and I, I certainly don't think I've found uh, any enlightenment, but I, I do feel like the pain of those types of searches is almost a prerequisite to see things in a new way. And I, I wish I had had a quick epiphany that <laughs> mine felt more like just pe peeling back layers of an onion and finding yet another layer and and more pain and and tears in the eyes um along the way but but um and and i and the onion there's there's still more layers it's incredible actually um uh how how complex this challenge is that we now are calling the poly crisis you know this idea that um there's all of these quote unquote problems, but they're all somehow interconnected with each other. And, um, and in fact, 
some people now refer to it as the meta crisis because they're all they all share some common root cause and and that's the question what is the root cause if we're going to deal with this we better get clear on on root causes and um you know i i guess i fall into the uh, the group of people who refuses to be labeled either a pessimist or an optimist uh i think to be a I think it's it could be it would be very rational to simply be a pessimist, but I don't think that's a an ethical choice. Um, I think we have to uh, keep you know keep working on it. But, but to to declare oneself being an optimist, I would suggest is to is is to is to um, the question one needs to ask himself is have I thought deeply enough about the poly crisis? So. I guess I I would put myself in the camp of hopeful um, and and hope being a verb, um, and um, uh, but I I do find this regenerative this idea that's underlying regenerative economics is that life is a miracle and uh, and life it turns out is alive, uh, the biosphere is alive. Uh, in fact, the scientists now can explain how the universe is alive, and we are alive and and life has this way of continuing even in the face of the second law of thermodynamics entropy and so if we could align our economy and our businesses and our banking and our uh all, all of our enterprises with the miracle of how life works then how could one not be but at least hopeful if not optimistic well that's a really good really good approach um and in my mind i'm kind of distilling it to the essence of um, gosh, it really is simple, although the <laughs> getting there is complex or the, the execution is yeah. complex. Um, the, the meta crisis, I was reading some of your stuff and I, I admit I have to, I had to Google it and, and drill down into the exact meaning of it. Um, and it is, it does feel like that's the case. And it kind of leads me to my next thought is uh, what are the solutions? Um, if you're hopeful, I'm, ho I'm hopeful. I, I can't give up hope. I, I, um, the, the one thing that drives me, which is self-imposed is I don't ever want my grandkids to say, grandpa, what was your generation thinking? You know? Um, yeah. And there's a, there's a great t-shirt that, um, I saw somewhere in my dark period. Um, I think it was a Pachamama Alliance t-shirt and it said something like, um, what did you do once you knew? <laughs> That's a great quote. And that I didn't make that up, I, but there is a t-shirt that, that had that. I can't remember where I saw it, but I think it came from Pachamama, but. That's, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, I think we're all feeling that and increasingly we'll, feel that way and and certainly as as we get older um you know but that you know to define the poly crisis it, it's actually a term that became fashionable at the world economic forum believe it or not um last year um and uh, but i think it was coined well over a decade ago and um it reminds me when i i was actually at a, at a little um I don't know, like a um, a, a little offsite uh, with um, Dennis Meadows, who is one of the co-authors of that same book I mentioned, Limits to Growth, one of the MIT scientists. And and this was, would have been back in about 2000, I don't know, 2004, five, six, maybe. And he was teaching us about system science and complexity science. and 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 one of our challenges is that you know, none of us are taught complexity science in school. Um, in fact, I had no idea it was even a thing until yeah. I read that book. And um, and increasingly, people are starting to study complexity science. But it, it turns out you can, in, in 1972, you could get a PhD in complexity science at MIT. Oh, but somehow the people running the world didn't know that. And... Um, and and it's really important to realize there's a difference between things that are complicated and things that are complex. Com complexity is a is a beast of its own 
uh, type. And, um, and, and in many ways, the challenges in, we're facing is because we've been trained to solve problems uh, using our analytical left hemisphere brain by reducing things that are complicated into their parts and then working on the parts. And we've specialized in, in our educational institutions into specializations and, and uh, disciplines. And in business, we've you know, got different departments for different things. And in government, we have different uh, agencies for different activities. And so we treat everything as if it's a big, big machine. And the thing about machines is that you can reduce them to parts. Uh, so you can break down an, a, an automobile engine into parts and understand the parts and reassemble it into a machine. Uh, and you can put a man on the moon thinking in a reductionist way. It's amazing the progress we've been able to make using this reductionist method. But it turns out that the reductionist method is not the way life actually works. Um, you can't break down your body into parts and understand the parts and have any idea of the whole of who you are. And, uh, and the premise of this whole living systems frame regenerative paradigm is that um, not only are humans living systems, but organizations are living systems and the entire economy is a living system. And we need to understand it for its complexity, not, not uh, treat it as if it's a machine that we can uh, solve problems. In. And, and so, so many of the uh, attempts to solve problems end up creating bigger problems than the problem we were trying to solve. And to go back to this systems complexity science, little uh, um, you know, education thing I was involved in. Dennis Meadows, um, you know, he was leading this this uh, little seminar, and and after he got done, someone asked him the question. Uh, and and the thing about complexity is that if you if if a system gets stressed enough, it it can collapse, right? It, it, it's kind of like a company. How does a company go bankrupt? Well, it goes bankrupt slowly and then quickly. Um, how does a how does a um, volcano erupt? Slowly and then quickly. Um, and these these are phase shift transitions. And so someone asked him, "So Dennis, how will we know if we're entering the collapse phase?" And and it was a heavy conversation, meaning the collapse phase of human civilization. And in, without even spending two seconds thinking about it, he said, "Oh, that's easy." The first thing to go will be our ability to cope. And uh, if if you're like me and you look out at the world and you read the newspaper, it's starting to feel like we're losing our ability to cope. And so I think we're at a um, an, an important moment in the history of civilization. And um, and we need to we need to take that very seriously and um, and somehow wrestle with these challenges even in the midst of our day-to-day -day real life, much more, um, um, you know, in a sense, um, personal uh, challenges that we have to deal with. We, we've got a bigger, there's a bigger issue facing humanity that we've got to grasp and, and wrestle with. Gosh, so it's like the uh, slowly, slowly, slowly overnight, um, this, like you said, this stuff's not new, the, the, uh, uh, complexity science was available as a as a degree program at at MIT a long time ago. And it's like the book Collapse by Jared Diamond, um, gosh, which yeah. was published what twenty years ago or something. Yeah. And yeah. you, and it's a fantastic book. If if any of the listeners haven't read it, you sh you should read it. It's dense. It's it's hard to. It's very. Long, Pour yourself a stiff dense. drink before you open it. <laughs> yes, um, but it's and it's also horrifying because you can see in there, um, you can look almost real time as to what's happening today. Yeah. But that kind of leads us back to the Capital Institute, which is for sure a change agent um, um, endeavor on your part. And um, I know you've got uh, courses now, and I think you're once you when you launch your your introductory course over a thousand people attended from 53 countries. So it's definitely um, educating and influencing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Capital Institute and just for the listeners sake, 
um, um, the Capital Institute did a, a documentary on First Green Bank, my, our last bank, and it was titled A Year in the Life of a Regenerative Bank. And it was a, extremely elucidating for me and my team and my board. Um, and that was kind of my introduction to some of the work the Capital Institute does, but it, you've really kind of even expanded pretty broadly past that. So I'll volley back to you. Yeah, no, that, that, um, so we, we did a, we, did, my colleague, Susan Artarian Chang, that's how we met was she, I don't know how she found your bank, Ken, but she was, um, she's a, she's a natural, she's a storyteller by profession, a writer and a, and, and, um, and passionate about storytelling. And, and it's interesting. She was way ahead of her time. Now storytelling is becoming fashionable. We we are recognizing that we need new stories, and stories are again not part of our mechanistic reductionist logic. They are they come out of our right hemisphere. Their their inspiration, their imagination, and um, and so we did a series of of stories. Uh, and in a couple of cases made little films out of them, like in the case of the first green bank and, um, and they're on our website still. It's a, it's a project called our field guide. And what we were trying to do is, is show all of these individual stories that are all unique in their own context and yet show how they were all part of one story. Um, and I, I use as an analogy, uh, the, the thing about living systems is that they follow a series of patterns. You, we, we recognize patterns um, that manifest in very different ways, but they're the same patterns. So, you know, one of the, the most uh, well understood one is this idea of fractals. Um, you know, the 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 idea that things repeat at from very small scale to very big scale. And uh, if you look anywhere in nature, you see fractal patterns. Um, I like to say that every snowflake is unique, but every snowflake looks like a snowflake. So we would look at First Green Bank and, and see things that mirrored what we would see when we went to Fogo Island in, in Newfoundland uh, and study an amazing project on Fogo Island. Um, but, but all of this was an attempt to communicate and to shift people's perspective uh, on what, you know, how they're seeing the world. Um, it's it's if if someone were to ask me what is the essence of our work, it's it's a revolution in the way of seeing what everyone else is already seeing, and so one person sees climate change and sees a problem, which is emissions, and yet we see uh, climate change as a symptom of the problem that we've interfered with the circulation of the that we there is a carbon cycle in the living in 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 the biosphere. Uh, and it is in. It needs to be in balance, and it's uh, we've we've tipped it out of balance, but it's not about just emissions. It's about the balance between natural sequestration and emissions. And so we, it, it, there's sort of to, to simplify it. There's there's two things that we've gotten wrong. One is that we can just dump carbon emissions in the in the atmosphere as if it's an endless trash heap. And the second is that we can we can industrialize agriculture so that we turn the largest carbon sink, the soils, into a carbon source, meaning we turn a natural sink into a daily additional source of emissions. And the two of those combined are what create the climate crisis. But in our reductionist mindset for the last 25 years, 95% of the focus has been on how do we stop carbon emissions? Which of course we have to do, but we've missed the opportunity to at the same time uh, redesign our entire agriculture system, our entire interaction between the land-based planet uh, and our human activities need to be rethought because it turns out that the grasslands and the forests and the peats and the oceans are not machines that we can manage. They are living systems themselves. Um, so, Anyway, I forgot. I'm I'm babbling on. I forgot what your your the prompt was, but um, but I would say that the work of the Capital Institute is really to try to reimagine how an economy can work, and and you know, given your and my knowledge of finance, we both 
we both understand the important role finance and the flow of capital is to how an economy works. It's kind of the lifeblood of an economy, if you will, um, or the circulation of oxygen of an economy. Um, I'm convinced we have a fundamental redesign process uh, underway that needs to happen or uh, or the system will collapse. Um, and that's the that's what I've chosen my uh, the 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 useful outcome of the angst that created the Atlas statue has been transformed into uh, exploring this idea, sharing this idea and um, and hopefully seeing it manifest in the world. Well, it's so it's so important and it's kind of the that whole flow of of capital and it ties into what is the real economy and what's the financial economy and um there's a, a lot of argument that the financial economy which is um what was it warren buffett that said the in 2008 the financial instruments of mass destruction yeah <laughs> um it certainly it falls yeah. falls in that category but America or the U.S. has always been a world leader in creative financial instruments and and financial approaches, and can't can't it be a good thing? Also, um, mm. you know, I don't. Do we abandon the the financial economy completely? Uh, I'm not sure that that that's a good thing. And that kind of leads back to values-based banking and trying to, yeah. to, to get an understanding. It's not really, it is changing. It needs to change the system, but it needs to change understanding of what exactly, you know, capital can do. And we always tell everybody to vote with your pocketbook and, um, mm. uh, and in banking, it's so important. You can bank with a bank that is an evildoer. To, to put it bluntly, or you can bank with a bank that's actually doing good, which there are some in the world yeah. and some in the U S um, and then it, it kind of, and I'm rambling. So um, it kind of leads to, okay, so you decide to launch a bank called first green bank. And then the investors um, rightfully expect a return. And I rightfully want to give them a good return because they're all my friends and, and family and it came down to the only way to do that was to sell the bank and then mm. everything's lost. And mm. it kind of felt to me like all that 10 years of hard work was lost, but in effect it really wasn't because it allowed the opportunity to launch climate first, but we right. want to go into perpetuity and still provide the shareholders an exceptional investment thesis. Mm. Um, it, it, do you have any, you know, insight or input into that thing? Yeah, I mean, well, first, full disclosure, I was, um, I, I guess I call myself a first generation derivatives professional at JP Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy>. <laughs> um, <laughs> truth be told, I, I actually, uh, honestly, that my break, um, short version of my my early career, I. I, uh, someone told me to learn how to use a spreadsheet, which was some really good advice because not everyone knew how to do that back in the day. And, uh, so I became known as this guy that knew how to do spreadsheets when I was 22 <laughs> years old or whatever. And turns out spreadsheets are really useful if you're going to try to do derivatives. And so before I knew it, I was in Tokyo, uh, for three years I, I landed in Japan, true story, the week the first yen interest rate swap happened on planet Earth Wow! to to work in derivatives and ultimately run the derivatives desk for JP Morgan in Asia at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 27 or eight years old. Um, and honestly, and it, it reminds me very much of what's happened with tech. You know, we, we were young, uh, naive, but largely well-meaning. And and mostly, uh, certainly, I would say at at our firm, entirely ethical. And this technology transformed the capital markets. It, it interestingly, it it connected all of the domestic capital markets into one seamless global capital market. So I could I could I'm not going to try to do it certainly here, but I could make the case that derivatives were part of the regenerative economy. It saw things as a whole as opposed to a bunch of parts. 
but the technology was um, exploited by um, uh, the extractive speculative casino and put to use, uh, put to bad use. And thus we had the financial crisis in 2009. And I can tell you as a, as a derivatives expert, I was blown away as everyone else by the, um, the violence that was imposed on, on the world economy by the perpetrators of the financial collapse, both the fraud, but also the, the willful, deceitful uh, structuring that, that went into some of those transactions. Uh, I was shocked. And, and so there's a lesson in, you know, the, the creators of new technologies. And this obviously is to me, you know, the lesson that we unfortunately didn't learn that we should be applying to the rise of AI, same lesson that we should have learned to the rise of social media. Uh, even the good guys uh, who are talking about and promoting all of the good things that AI can do for us uh, are naive to the many ways that the bad guys, so to speak, uh, will find a way to, to, to use technology for, uh, for destructive ends. So, um, but, um, but getting back to, to finance for a second, I, you know, and again, it's a, it's another example that the regenerative economy is hidden in plain sight. The, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values is a is a network that First Green Bank was a part of, Climate First Bank is a part of, um, uh, the um, uh, California Bank you mentioned is a part of, Triodos Bank is a part of. And even though um, no one in those banks created them because of some vision for regenerative economy, they intuitively created a group of banks that that were aligned with healthy economies. And if you compare the, the um, global alliance, global alliance uh, of banking on values principles with living systems principles, you see a lot of overlap. And not surprisingly, these banks are involved in the real economy, making real loans for good things, either good new businesses or transforming existing assets to make them better they're all part of this regenerative economy, even if they don't use that term. Um, so one of the reasons going back to should one remain be hopeful is that uh, if 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 we learn to see the regenerative economy in front of us, um, we can be very optimistic that it's actually happening. The only question in my mind is, can it happen quickly enough before we we tip off the off the edge of the cliff, so to speak? Are we? I wouldn't uh, even say the internet. You know, one of the one of the principles of a living system is the is is a metabolism, right? It metabolizes energy. Well, in in an economy, it also metabolizes uh, information, and you know, lo and behold, the internet shows up just in time to be this incredible exponential information circulation technology. We've just used it for some bad we've put some bad business models on it. So we have, a, we have an extractive business model uh, being um, uh, executed by the companies like Facebook. So they're taking this incredible technology, but they're using it for uh, destructive extractive ends, which is to sort of mine our data rather than mining uh, oil um, and creating all kinds of um, consequences that I, I think are probably unintentional you know, not intentional consequences, but we've got a mental health crisis among our with our children, which is directly related to the business model of of the Facebooks of the world. But it isn't the necessary outcome of having the internet. The internet is incredible, and it's aligned with the need to circulate information and even empathy. You know, we, we circulate photographs and we circulate emojis, so we're connected in a way that humanity has never been connected before. That's that's the regenerative economy. Um, we just have to learn how to manage it in, uh, more wisely. Absolutely. And, um, but doesn't that kind of, boy, that really makes me, makes me think. Um, there's just so many things that, well, like the mental health crisis, um, so many things that have been exploited and um, maybe not intentionally, but once, it was discovered, you know, 
what did you do once you knew? <laughs> um, right. and, and there's now, it's been proven there's a direct link to glyphosates, um, which is Roundup for anybody that doesn't know, um, to um, spectrum disorders in, in children. And there's been cases where just eliminating glyphosates from an autistic child's diet, they have been able to cure autism. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, uh, you know, food industrial complex with the absolute garbage uh, food that we're all subjected to all day, every day. Um, it's like, what, what the hell, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, why is this, why is this happening? Why is it allowed to continue? Um, and it, it kind of goes back to the creative financial instruments. And I mean, just in the U S well, I guess worldwide, but the U S especially, cause I think we started it two huge financial crises in just the last, 15 years you know mm -hmm. with the meltdown and then last march's um uh, march madness with svb bank and um mm -hmm. it, 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 are we destined to just be in a perpetual cycle of economic or health boondoggles you know um it, i don't know i i say i'm hopeful but then i i lose all hope and um mm -hmm. and like you I, I went through a period of intense absolute clinical depression um and yeah I, 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 it's sort of a, a you know if 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 you're not feeling a little bit depressed you know you're not paying attention kind of a thing <laughs> yeah 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 um, and then it's and then it, it, i don't hesitate to tell anybody that i've suffered from depression my whole life i i think that kind of stuff needs to be socialized but um mm, just so no but so tough. people won't give up hope so much yeah. um but back to the hopefulness or but I, I think you know if you, if you go back to your um you know the food system i mean it's um it's just such a a great example of thinking of food in a mechanistic way you know we 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 we, we we've allowed ourselves to convert food which is a sacred i mean putting food in your body is a sacred act. Like it should be, it's not a business. It's, it's fundamental to who we are literally, you know, physiologically, as well as, you know, uh, the, the, the impact it can have on, a, on our health. And yet we've, we've commoditized the practice of eating into a, a quote unquote industry called food. Uh, or food and beverages. And then the food and beverage companies treat that act as if it's um, putting gasoline in a car. Calories, make the calories taste good so that the car is addicted to the calories, put it in a pretty box, give it a lot of shelf life. Uh, don't fill the box to the top because it'll look like it's more than it is. Um, but there has to be some addictive quality to it. So make sure that we get the chemists back there making it addictive and, and then run a bunch of ads that make, make us want to eat it. Um, and, and all of that is mechanistic thinking. It's, it's thinking that the human body is a machine like a car and it just needs calories. Uh, and it's, it's uh, thinking that a, a business is merely a machine and the algorithm is optimized shareholder returns. We've allowed ourselves to, in fact, I was, you know, back in when I was a banker, um, uh, this idea of shareholder value was essentially, I, I don't think it was invented then. I think it was invented probably in the 70s, but it was popularized by banks like ours. And the thing about shareholder value driven financial decision-making, in fact, someone recently just told me that in the 1970s, there was no such thing as a chief financial officer. Really? That's a new, that's a new thing. Really? There was, there was no an accountant. Idea. There was a head accountant who counted the beans, but there, there wasn't a financial strategy. There was no such thing as financial strategy. There was business strategy. Huh. Think about that. And huh. now we have chief financial officers whose primary job is to figure out how to optimize shareholder value. And, and, and I don't say that 
uh, being critical. I say that completely objectively. That didn't used to exist. And now that's not only a thing, but it's in many ways the dominant, it, it, it's in many ways the most powerful person in a big corporation, uh, certainly next to the CEO. And many CEOs are former CFOs on top of it. Um, Absolutely. You know, the, 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 the unaccepted or the unquestioned truth that shareholder value is the way business has to work is, um, is, a, is a fiction of our imagination. But it has consequences that, that include the crazy uh, exponential rise of autism in our children. Um, for the reasons you mentioned and other reasons. Yeah. Wow. So um, carrying that forward in the, again, in the hope context, I did not know that the chief financial officer was a recent invention, um, but yeah, we I, are I, now. I read that somewhere. I'm not, I haven't checked that that's true, but, but even in my own career uh, that resonates, right? Because when I was in the training program, we were taught that, the role of a bank is to essentially figure out what our clients' needs were and serve those needs. Mm -hmm. Now you have bankers running around convincing companies uh, of how to deploy capital that they have ready to shovel in their face. Yeah. So they're they're pumping transactions at them. You should buy this company. You should buy that company. You should sell this division. You should do this. You should do that all to optimize shareholder value yeah, as yeah. opposed to tell me about your business and how can I serve your business? Yeah, absolutely. And I wasn't questioning that, that it, because when I graduated from college, there wasn't CFOs. Um, yeah. In, in 1981, that wasn't, a, that wasn't something that was posted on the job boards. Um, and so uh, fast forward to today, Five years ago, there was no such thing as a chief sustainability officer or a chief, right? Uh, you know, a values officer or whatever. And now you're seeing that maybe, maybe, maybe that's yeah. part of the hopeful thing of, uh, of yeah. that be that gains the prominence. And and to your point on the CFO being the at least second most powerful person, if not the first, look at the compensation. We've got this yeah. incredibly outsized, outsized CEO compensation, and nobody mentions the CFOs. But you look on the annual reports; it's massive. I mean, now you've got yeah. cases of CFOs retiring as billionaires. Yeah, yeah. from yeah, it's certainly not the bean companies. counter. It's not the bean counter role it used to be. That's for sure. No, not at yeah. all. Um, yeah. That is fascinating, and and maybe that's the hope, um, Lauren. But, but, it, but it's interesting you mentioned the chief sustainability officer. What, what I would say is that the chief sustainability officer is the, it's the band aid to attach to the to the wound, as opposed to dealing with the root cause. Um, and this gets into an entirely new conversation about what leadership means in the twenty first century. But for me. The, the this can't be parsed out among different specialty functions and and we'll have someone deal with sustainability stuff and you know we now call we, 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 people in finance refer to the ESG space <laughs> as if it's a separate thing from business you know and I got lots of problems with ESG but one thing I can tell you it's not a space separate from everything else and the chief sustainability officer for every corporation on this planet has a title and it's CEO, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but uh, but we'll do what we do, which is to bolt on some fixes in the meantime. That's a that's um, a really that's a really great observation. Also, it really is the CEO, and I didn't come up with this. Somebody did, and I heard it somewhere. Is um, the sustainability as a term is not uh, is not adequate at all. If, for instance, somebody asked you how your marriage was right. or your relationship. And you said, well, it's sustainable. I say, well, yeah. I know a good divorce lawyer because, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's not there for the long run. So maybe we should change it to um, chief regeneration officer or something. And um, well, the thing about the word regeneration, and this is maybe, I, I know um, I see Lauren's popping in. So that's, that's my cue to stop talking. But um, the thing about regeneration is I would say two things briefly. One is, 
My guess is that most people who are in this conversation hearing this, that'll resonate strongly with that word. There's something about that word that feels alive. Um, you, you kind of, it, it's an attractor, whereas sustainable, and I, I got no problem with the word sustainable, but it doesn't have that same quality. Right. Um, but more importantly, regeneration actually has a meaning, which is the, the regeneration is the process that explains how life actually works. Like if you go read a textbook or you go to study ecology, regeneration is a real thing. Um, you know, our bodies are regenerating as we speak. Uh, on average, our cells regenerate every seven years. Uh, a forest regenerates. Um, a family regenerates. Uh, a river regenerates. Um, uh, nothing that's alive can stay alive. Uh, nothing that's alive is not regenerating. And... Right. Regeneration includes death and decay and the cycle of life. And that's another thing that we don't seem to get in our, in our idea of an economy. We, 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 just like we do in our personal lives, we don't accept that some things need to die and be and decayed and turn into compost and, and those nutrients come back in some different form. And knowing what we know now, the entire fossil fuel industry needs to die. And how that happens and how we manage that is a huge challenge, but we have to save that. And, and it doesn't mean that we should have Exxon putting up solar panels because digging for oil a mile underground has nothing to do with assembling solar panels and putting them on the roof. So as far as I'm concerned, there's no reason why Exxon, and I'm picking on Exxon because they deserve it. Um, uh, they led <laughs> climate denial for two decades. Um, uh, but but that company should be allowed to die. And there's a smart way to do that, that would protect investors as best they can um, and re, re channel, re, you know, re compost or compost those incredible resources into better uses. Well, I won't, I still to this day will not buy gas from an Exxon or mobile station because <laughs> really? I remember the Exxon Valdez clearly and yeah. um, that oil spill and the, the people trying to clean the birds. So yeah. um, that stuck well, with me. Worse, for God, as horrible as that years. is, the, the worst, and this is now all documented, they, they their scientists were warning about um, uh, climate change all, all the way back in the, at least the 70s, if not earlier. And they start building their offshore oil rigs higher, knowing that sea level rise was coming. Mm. And I'll I'll stop. I won't I won't keep going just for <laughs> it's a bad story. It's a very dark story. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I was really liking the dialogue, so I didn't want to jump in with questions quite yet, but we only have 10 minutes. But I do feel like we have one question that really ties into what we were just talking about. And um, it comes from Adam actually, and it's just like, how do we like speed up the acceptance of a regenerative economy into society now? Like, what what do we do? Like, we know this is a model. Me and you know it. Ken and I know it. We all know it. But what do we do to to get that more socially accepted? So, um, I'm I'm a big believer that in that we need to um, shift our worldview as the as the first step. Because I'll give you a, a really quick example. I during the Obama administration, I went down to Washington and argued for a financial transaction tax, which to me is a no-brainer tax policy to essentially penalize and tax excess, spe excess speculation, which would cause the returns of the short-term speculating hedge funds to go down, which would cause that capital to flow into better things such as Climate First Bank. And in the Obama administration, I couldn't get, no one understood what I was talking about. I explained it as uh, in a living systems perspective, but all they could see is taxes. Taxes are bad. Taxes are bad for market efficiency. Therefore, it'll hurt growth. Therefore, why are you telling me about taxes? So I think that, that Lauren, the first thing is we need to slow down and not rush to solutions to our problems but figure out how to shift the, the worldview that we look at our problems through. And this is a, a huge conversation. Um, in our course, we, we say that you, you, the only way this works is to do it at the level of the eye. So it begins with the, with the 
personal transformation, then the level of the we, so it can work inside Climate First Bank, uh, and then you can get to the it, which is the economic system. And we need to, in a sense, work on all three of these at the same time. But the first step is this worldview shift. And, and that's really why I've focused so much of my effort on the you know, on on clarifying a, an alternative worldview and then trying to articulate it. Um, uh, and unfortunately, as as the the shit hits the fan, our natural tendency is to, you know, try to stop the bleeding. So we rush to our solutions without dealing with the worldview shift. So we we may plug a dike here and there, but we end up not actually dealing at the root cause level. Thanks, John. Um, another question is uh, somebody wrote, like you said, that you had problems with ESG. And did you want to elaborate on them? Oof. <laughs> so <laughs> in uh, in brief. Um, so first of all, I, I, there is lots of, of good intention and good things about the what I'll call the ESG industrial complex. And certainly uh, measuring things that matter is is a good idea. And there are things beyond financial performance that matter. So our accounting systems are woefully inadequate to deal with the true nature of, of the business enterprise at the scale that business is today um, uh, on the planet and the impact that it has on society. Um, interestingly, accounting was developed in the, the same reductionist materialist um, uh, mindset. You know, we, we only measure stuff that we can put a number on. Uh, and by definition, that's not going to be everything that matters. Um, but that's what accounting was designed to do is to stay away from the stuff that you can't measure and put a number on. Um, so there's, there's a lot of good things about ESG. Uh, but the, the problem with it is that we're not clear in our thinking there's uh, and f and if people are interested in this, I would recommend um, the work that Bill Bowie at at R three has done. But the gist of it is, um, most ESG measures are getting after measuring the risk to my company of the environmental, social, and governance risks that are out there. So, for example, the fires out west created a massive risk to the utility industry. And Warren Buffett is out saying, you know, these companies may go bankrupt. That is ESG risk on a utility company. But the risk that really matters is the risk that Exxon's product creates for society. Um, so there's a difference between outside in risk and inside out risk is the language that people are using. And then the third layer, which is the most critical, is once you get to the inside out risk, what is my product or service? doing to society or doing to the environment, uh, we went. We then bump, now we're back to 1972, limits to growth. Uh, who's gonna decide how much emissions you get to emit versus I get to emit? And how do we even think about that problem? There's a north-south complexity to it. There's a industry A versus industry B, but the way we've set up our system, um, you know, Jeff Bezos gets to go buy a or build a 500 foot yacht with a 250 foot tender with a helicopter on it and burn emissions all day long because he's got money. Uh, and yet that's using up the finite resource of the atmosphere while a family in India does not have heat or electricity in their home. Um, but there's a limited amount of emissions that the atmosphere can take. And oh, by the way, we're already at it. Um, so the ESG framework doesn't doesn't help us deal with these much more uh, profound questions, as as described. Those are great insights. Um, there's a couple questions I'm going to try to combine because we're running out of time, and a lot of them just revolve around um, you know banks and the financial industries and their financing of um, oil companies and. Like, how do we step away from that? I mean, obviously, we all kind of depend on fossil fuels at the moment in a lot of our, our lives. But um, how do we start that shift in an effective way? The, the shift away from fossil fuels or the financing of fossil fuels? I think a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think they kind of go hand in hand a little bit or a lot. Of well, <laughs> this is there. I don't have an I don't have an answer. It's a huge 
um, bind we've put ourselves in because it's it's you know it's it's what Nora Bateson calls the ultimate double bind. We 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 can't stop burning fossil fuels uh, or we collapse civilization. But if we keep burning fossil fuels, we collapse not only civilization but everything that supports civilization. And um, uh, I I think. I guess I'd make a couple points on the financing side. Um, I think if you talk to someone in the oil and gas industry, they would tell you that no one wants to finance them anymore. So there's a there's a disconnect between the activist reports that we read that say that J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and Citibank are horrible because they keep financing fossil fuels, and the perspective of the fossil fuel executives who say I can't get financed. I don't know where the truth is between those. But um, but I do think that the banking sector in general uh, has begun to respond uh, uh, to the to the reality that that, you know, the business they're in now is helping their clients transition out of fossil fuels, not just pumping more and more fossil fuels. Having said that, they are financing new fossil fuel projects. So it's it's a it, it's a, it's a tough one, but but the the harder part of your question, Lauren, is is you know we I mean you know there are experts way way more qualified than me to talk about this transition plan, um, and there are people with very sophisticated ideas on what that looks like, um, but from what I've read and and studied and I've studied this quite a bit, um, while theoretically possible to electrify everything and transition off of fossil fuels in a relatively short time frame, meaning two, one or two decades, um, there are so many challenges in the details. The devil's in the details, um, and it, it's everything from batteries to mining to putting up more electric wires to uh, the chemistry of moving electron. I mean, it's just incredibly um, complicated. And um, and we're just not making progress. You know, you just look at the data, and we just keep inventing.